Hello, we have been studying branching narrative for several streams now, and today we're going to be wrapping that up. We are going to be seeing what we missed by watching a GDC talk on branching narrative, and then we're going to see if we can apply what we learned from this to our notes that we already have about and how we can apply that to XR UX design. And the goal of this whole stream, the goal of what I do here with my company is to help you get experience, practical experience with your critical thinking. And you can do that by participating live in the chat, typing your notes, typing your comments in the chat. And if you are watching on demand, you can also type your comments later. I do pay attention to that. The goal here, again, is to help you get actual experience, practical experience by participating. And what we're doing here, the, your ability to participate in critical thinking is a very important skill that you're going to need for your job, any job, but especially for a UX design job. So what we do here is we learn from games so that we can create better immersive experiences. And... Again, you can make your own comments in the chat while I'm talking through things. And if you're watching later, you can add your comments later. So let's go ahead and get started on this. We're going to watch a video that is from GDC. All choice, no consequence, efficiently branching narrative to see what have we missed. Because we already have a lot of notes here. On And you can review these videos later if you want. And I've got a branching narrative playlist for you to check out on my channel but we're going to see what we missed because we made all of these observations based on the games that we've played we haven't like looked at any like training sources or study sources or anything but we are going to be seeing what we missed and adding that here so let's go Hey guys, thanks for coming. Uh, my past life was as a conference organizer like Tom, so these organized presentations are a little new to me. Ah, but thanks so much for coming to my talk on all choice, no consequence, how to efficiently branch your game's narrative. You are probably sitting in the audience because you have realized, like so much of us, that interactive narrative is super in right now. We are seeing it on the top grossing charts of the iOS store in a lot of interactive story games, like the game I work for, Episode Interactive, as well as some of Telltale's hit titles, Inkle, uh, and that new, what is that little space traveler one? Uh, I didn't put it on my slide. We're also seeing it in adventure games. Adventure games used to be very linear, but we're starting to see dialogue branches happening where you can start to own the character a little bit more and customize how they respond to prompts. Things like Broken Age and Kentucky Route Zero are some example of those. And you're even seeing it in AAA titles. Uh, Fallout 4, Mass Effect, and Shadow of Mordor got a lot of buzz for how much agency they gave their players and how much they allowed them to customize their narratives. But there's a giant question of, is it worth it? Uh, Liam is giving a talk tomorrow. I've learned you should check it out. It's on branching narrative. He'll have a lot of data to back up what I'm about to say, so you should go see it. Uh, but in general, when you think about it, you're trying to write hundreds of different storylines with thousands of different character interactions, millions of different lines of dialogue. And if you're trying to do it that way, you're actually wrong. That is the wrong approach to writing interactive fiction. It'll get you really lost in your script, it'll get you really muddied, and it'll probably get you to miss all of your budgets and all of your deadlines. So my hope is to teach you how to design your choices smartly. So we do know, and I agree, and the data shows that having choice matters in your game. It improves your retention, it makes your game more fun, and it makes your players happier. Those choices, most importantly, have to feel impactful to the players. They have to feel like they make a difference. The data shows that having choices that are actually impactful to your storyline, not really a big deal, and tends to be a waste of really valuable time and money when your game is being developed. So I'm hoping to help you design your choices a little more smartly. So why am I standing here? Who am I? Why does GDC uh, want me at giving this talk? So I'm Cass Phillips. I'm a creative manager at Episode Interactive. That is a platform for mobile interactive animated stories. We empower our players to create these stories, so we have over 13,000 stories live on our app. We have over 3.5 million weekly active users. 
Over 1.5 billion episodes have been played, and we are regularly a top grossing iOS app. Mostly what this means is that we have a lot of data on what branching is, on what choices work, on what choices don't, on how to do that retention. And we've made a lot of stories internally, so I'm gonna hope to share with you guys some uh, tips and tricks we've learned along the way. For example, here's a choice example. Uh, I have a really long narrative, it won't change that much, uh, but I have set some information in it that you may or may not be interested in. So I'm presenting with you a choice on how you'd like to see the information and what is most important to you. It won't drastically change your story, but it'll change how the presentation flows a little bit. So a quick show of hands, you can learn more about episode in our data, you can learn more about how I execute branches, or you can have me avoid engaging with you. Show of hands, who is most interested in episode in our data? Just a few, great. Who is most interested in how to execute on these branches? Ah, done more, yes, good, I didn't like the data anyway. Uh, who wants me to stop asking you questions? Great, I'm gonna keep asking questions, but I don't have that many, don't worry. So I'm gonna skip these slides. La, 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 la. That's a clever way of doing a presentation. If you want some uh, tips on presentation, <laughs> maybe you can make a branching one and then get your audience engaged. That's pretty cool. La, la, la. Okay. We'll come back to them if there's time. You can ask questions. So I break branching our stories into four very distinct parts that barely ever cross. There are the choices, there is the dialogue, there is the story, and there are the branches. I do separate branches and branches from just choices. I want to take this note. I'm going to screenshot that. It here. I'm going to attribute it to her, don't worry. Let's see, share. And go ahead and make your comments in the chat as well. Um, what are, what's standing out to you as we go along? Quick show of hands, another classic choice example. I am the NPC, I'm asking you, the player character, your opinion. It's not gonna change how I respond, but it allows you to have like be friends or enemies with me. Uh, one for choices, two for dialogue, three for story, four for branches. What is most important to the success of your interactive fiction game? Show of hands, one for choice, two for dialogue, three for a story, four for branches. There's a pretty good mix, so I'm actually kind of surprised there's a pretty good mix, because I think there's a right answer, and I think the right answer is story. Uh, so any of you said three, that's what I think the right answer is. That's what our data suggests, yes, that I'll show later. So always start with your story. That is the first step to creating your, uh, the narrative of your game. Uh, it is the most important part. It will define how players are reacting. This is not a story talk, so I have one quick slide on it. Go to some great story talks given by somebody else. Uh, most importantly, your story needs to be impactful, it needs to be meaningful, it needs to have a great theme. This is not a time to be distracting yourself with branches and choices. They will just muddy your process. Every time that we start discussing branches in our outline phase or our story room, we get lost, we lose where our act breaks are, and our beats start to get really, really muddied. This is a phase to just create a really great outline. An outline should be read by strangers and they feel engaged, they feel interested, they can follow it, but they may still have a few questions, which is a great place for your outline to be in when you move to branches, which are definitely the most fun. So something to keep in mind with branches. Uh, a this is an important thing to know about any type of design is you always start with the <clears throat> basic flow or the basic journey of whatever it is you're doing, whether that's a story or whatever. You start with the basic first, get that firm foundation going, and then once you've got that firm foundation there, then you can start figuring out the variations and the branches and so forth. That is relevant to anything. A lot of data, Liam will show you some of this tomorrow, uh, shows that your players are not replaying your game that often. You should not design for replays. You should design for their very first experience to be fun. We've also noticed in our data on ep that episode that branching doesn't act actually affect replayability all that much. I don't have specific numbers, but here's a nice little graph. If we take the pink one, that's a story called the ember effect, that is about our average replayability. The ember effect has no branches at all. 
has some little tiny choices. We compare it to Finding Mr. Right. Finding Mr. Right is a story we produce that is 15 episodes long. It's about 150 minutes of gameplay. Very easy to replay. It has uh, four major storylines running through it that you can interact with. It has 12 different endings. It has hundreds, if not thousands, of choices in it. We advertise all of this upfront, and it is replayed slightly above average. Take a great story. Super Secret Cedar Hill is an example of that. A lot of our recent originals are examples where we brought it into a story room, we really workshopped the story. It has no branching whatsoever, and it's getting a little above massive branching. Have any of you ever played these Pocket Gems games? I haven't. I generally play much bigger games. If you look at Tangled Love, that is our most replayed story, it also has no branching until the very end, where a single choice gives you four different endings. What it does do really well it is a number of small choices that are all about relationship building and just about feeling like I am responding to the characters around me and they are reacting in very small ways to me. And we think that that is leading to a lot of its replayability. So on that note, branches, still really fun, still really cool. We do put them in our game. Uh, how, first of all, what is a major branch? Just so we know the difference between a good branch and a bad branch. So a major branch is something that's probably a change in many scenes or uh, characters due to the choice that those players made. Usually it's going to be a unique way to reach the same goal. Again, you have those goals on your outline, those beats through it. It's going to be different ways that you get to them. It's probably strong enough that it is memorable and you can reference it periodically through the story and the player is not left scratching their head like, when did I make that choice? What is that about? And as a reminder, it is not a completely disconnected storyline. You always want to bring these back to your major story. Some examples out in the industry so you can stay aware of it. Uh, in Demi Lovato, which was the game I worked on and that I creatively led, uh, who you date is a pretty major branch. It will show you different scenes. Your dates will be different. How that character reacts to you will change. But the main story is going to be the same. Uh, who you save in episode two of The Walking Dead is a great example of this. Uh, it'll change uh, all of your character interactions with that character in the next scenes, but in the end, it doesn't change the story. And then in Inkle's Sorcery, for example, where you actually go on the map will change the scenes that you see, but the basic goals will stay the same. So how do you find branches? That's obviously what you're here for. How can you find them really, really quickly? One of the major ones that we look at is our story room disagreements. If you guys don't have story rooms, I suggest you get them, but if you still aren't gonna have story rooms, uh, it's when you're ever discussing the outline with someone and there's a pretty big disagreement about how something goes. What happens with us is the story, late, uh, the story lead or the writer takes point, they make a decision and they move on because now is not the time for branches, but they put a little note in the margin, add a branch here. Uh, an example of this is when we were writing our Mean Girls story with Paramount, uh, the love interest Micah, we had a disagreement in the story room whether you should kiss him or not. If you kiss him too early, it felt like the chase went away. I already won the dating game. I don't need to pursue. But also, if I kiss him, it ups the stakes of the relationships. It makes it more serious. We moved forward with not kissing him, but we went back later, added a kiss, changed a number of scenes after that. But like any rom-com, you end up having some big fight over some big disagreement, and the kiss is irrelevant. Uh, so look for story room disagreements. Two, again, that outline has key beats on it. They're probably each giving you a piece of information and they're progressing the story in an interesting way, I hope. See if you can reorder those. Uh, there was a great example of this in Telltale's The Wolf Among Us, where you could choose to go to Prince Charming's house first or Mr. Toad's house first. They set up very clear consequences right up front, which is an important thing I'll touch on later, uh, to say that if you went to one of these places first, you would miss out on something happening at the other one. But in the end, you'll go to both You'll get the same key story information, but you'll feel like you have changed one of those characters' lives just a little bit. So your outline is maintained, uh, but you have a nice little branch where the players felt like they could customize it. And finally, looking at that outline, look at each major goal that you've set up in the outline and figure out how to answer the how question that is between goal A and goal B, or conflict A and conflict B. Um, that's why you keep that outline a little bit loose. An example of this in one of our stories on episode, My Brother's Best Friend, you must have a fight with your parents. It is part of the story. It also is, uh, must be about your eating disorder, which is, it is a story about an eating disorder. Uh, how you have that fight and what triggers it is up to the players and the choices that they make. So we've seen it with a couple of choices. We have a few big branches on exactly what triggers this fight, but the fight happens no matter what. So this was a great moment where we could just kind of adjust the how uh, to create more player agency. We have found that generally getting one branch in as soon as possible is important. We have one within 12 lines of dialogue in Demi Lovato because this shows your players that their choices are going to matter with everything they do. It's going to drastically change the story 
even if it doesn't. I've seen some of the games that I've actually played here on stream for this series on branching narrative. It took, it, at least it felt like it took over 30 minutes and there was no obvious branch. Um, maybe that was because I was talking, so it was taking longer. But those stories, those games, we didn't really get into any, for our example, Persona 5, it didn't feel like we got to any real choices because there was a lot of cutscenes, a lot of backstory going on, and no real choices yet. Still setting up all the backstory, so it took quite a bit of time before you even got to a point where you could make decisions, which, yes, the story is very good, so in Persona 5's case, it's not so much of a big deal, but I think it depends on the size of your game and the goals of your game. How much does branching narrative play into it? But trying. I forgot my thought, so never mind. But this is a great bit of advice on using those disagreements from the main story to decide on your branches. That's pretty good. I like this advice. But it plants that seed in their head. We then put a major branch in roughly every 20 to 30 minutes of gameplay. Uh, that seems to be about industry norm when I look at uh, Mass Effect and Telltale games. I don't have great data to tell you that that's right, but it kind of feels good. Uh, for us, that's about every two to three episodes, uh, and in the Telltale games, if you play it, you'll notice there's one to two per episode. And actually, with training, if you're doing training, XR training, which is what I come from, you would want this branch to be much sooner. You wouldn't want to wait 20 or 30 minutes of play before you start having them make decisions. You want them to make decisions way sooner than that. And with the... Um, this is going to actually be pretty different for training um, because what she's doing is she's talking about subtle changes but it's not affecting the overall story but with XR training depending on you know like from my background safety with consequences so if you make the wrong choice bad things happen if you make the right choice everyone lives um, so there are different types of branching narrative, and we've talked about this before. We've talked about map of many endings, which is what my type of training would be, that safety with consequences would be a map of many endings. Um, and it would be up to your scope and stuff to determine how many endings there are. But usually it starts, usually it's just like two endings, the good one and the bad one because of scope and time, and it, it does take quite a bit of effort to create an XR, a VR, specifically training sim. So in that case, there are only two endings, a good one and a bad one. But there could be many endings. It could be you made this safe choice here, but then you missed this safe choice over here, so there was consequence, but it wasn't as big of a consequence if you had missed everything. So there could be many different endings in that case, but what she's talking about more feels like a bottleneck. So the bottleneck is where you start in the same place. You can make varied choices, but there's something that happens in the story that brings everyone back to the same place. And for example, um, with uh, any of these stories, Wilder Myth, Life is strange, and so forth. You have an overall, overall arching story, and that story is set. But you can make decisions, and this happens in Dungeons and Dragons as well. You can make um, various decisions on how you get there, but the outcome, the overall story is going to be the same. The details are what change, and that's the type of branching narrative that she's talking about. But with again with if you're doing something like training or training with consequences, 
it's going to your goals are different so again it depends on the goals um let's see let me make that note it depends on the goals of of your experience so let me i don't have any notes to say this is me talking versus her I'll just move it over here it depends on the goal of your experience so um maybe if as uh, storytelling you want to give license but goal is to entertain then you could do bottleneck or you, you know, you could choose whatever string of pearls, whatever. But open world. But but if you're doing like training with consequences, you're you're gonna want a map of many endings. And then in that case, then you would have the good and bad outcomes. So it depends on your goal. And then she's saying 20 to 30 minutes of gameplay. I would say this depends on, again, your goal and what how long your game is and so forth because you don't want to wait 20 30 minutes after 20 30 minutes of gameplay for training that's wasting everyone's time so yeah it de definitely depends on the goal of what it is you're doing let me group this up so that it um, is more clear that it's coming from this video Okay. As a reminder, this is the branch stage. It is not the choice stage, which in my mind are very distinct things. Branches are the things that you must outline before you write them. Do not get bogged down in your choices at this moment. It's again, just gonna get you lost in the weeds. You don't even have your dialogue yet. You're not positive how a scene is gonna flow. Don't worry about choices right now. You've just got an outline and you've got some great branches. So you outline those branches, you make sure they work, they stick to your core story, you get your writer back on it, and you write a great script, because now you're ready for some scripts. Again, it's not a story talk, it's a branching talk, so just one slide. Uh, some things to keep in mind when you're doing dialogue in games, make sure you have very unique character voices. I should be able to read a line of dialogue and know exactly who said it. Make sure each line of dialogue has a very succinct and clear reason to be there, especially on mobile, attention spans are very short. Make sure you have set up very clear consequences and goals with each line of dialogue. I've noticed in gaming that sometimes we need to be a little bit more on the nose, but we're trying to get our players to read. And make sure you're obviously discussing regularly with your design team. How you write a script for a AAA uh, first-person shooter is going to be very different than how you write a script for an adventure game. So finally, the fun part, choices. It's my favorite. Uh, a quick bit of data here. This is one of our stories that was fine, so we were willing to kind of rip it apart and play with it. Um, we tested a version for very first time players that had no choices in it whatsoever. Big surprise, retention was down. This is a retention chart uh, for the story. So no choices, bad. The other two lines, however, are us putting in 10 choices that we worked kind of hard on. I've played multiple types of games and one of the games that I started playing but actually quit pretty quickly um, that I thought I would absolutely love was Steins Gate. And I, I love the anime but when I started to play the game I just felt like I was not it was just a visual novel I didn't feel like I had any choice so I got bored very quickly even though there were interactions that I could do I had no choice in those interactions I need to go try it again maybe I'm wrong but I uh, the chart is pretty I didn't even make it through the first chapter <laughs>
I didn't even that's because this is showing chapters. I didn't even make it that far because I'm like, OK, I don't even have any choices. And maybe I just need to go back and stick with it a little longer and see. But I was pretty I dropped it pretty quick because I didn't feel like. And I could be wrong. I should have stuck with it longer. Maybe I'll go try it again. But there is a time and that wasn't even I'm not even sure that was 30 minutes. Play. So when she was advising 20 to 30 minutes, it's possible that you might actually need something sooner than that. Because unless there are people out there that do like visual novels, there is a, a group of people that do. What, do you have you ever played a visual novel? Um, let me know what you think of them. But I, I get pretty bored with them pretty quickly. But uh, I have no prompts against anybody who does enjoy them. I just get bored with them. And 20 choices that we did in the same amount of time. So just kind of got in choices wherever we could see them and make them fit. You'll notice immediately the retention doesn't really change. I don't have a sweet spot for you for exactly how many choices you need. For us, we found that about a choice per uh, page of dialogue or about a choice per minute to minute and a half of interactivity seems to feel fun in play tests. That feels, that feels about right to me. Um, if I don't have any choices and it's just dialogue, 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 I get very annoyed very quickly. And I'll just stop reading the dialogue. Unless it's incredibly good dialogue. But I see most often that I just start skipping the dialogue because I'm not reading it unless I actually have a choice to engage in this and it needs to be good engagement. So and it, it needs to be written well. That's why branching narrative is a skill. It is a an art. Be able to write good branching narrative and good branching dialogue. Um, it's not something that you can just dabble in and expect to have a great hit. There, It is an art. Just like many other things. And there, it's a course of study that you do and study and gain expertise in after years. It's not something that you can just pick up and unless you're, of course, a prodigy or you have some kind of experience that is going to directly apply to it, like very skilled in writing. But for the most, for most of us, for the normal people, it takes a lot of study and effort to get good at. The main takeaway here is to make a few great choices not a hundred mediocre ones. So where can you find those choices really, really quickly so you get that? Right. She just said exactly what I said. Really good choices, not mediocre ones. I was, and that's what I'm talking about. When I tend to get frustrated and just start skipping and not reading the dialogue is when I feel like the dialogue is mediocre and so, and, and, I just don't care. And I'm the kind of person who hates small talk. I hate small talk. Um, <laughs> and so whenever they're doing small talk in games, which is what a lot of it feels like when they're doing this, I just I just don't care. I I don't care. Please stop. Game out the door. Number one for me, a really huge cheat. I do a control F through my entire script for the question mark. Every question mark in your script is probably an NPC character asking your character a question. That is a choice. Uh, I then look at the line of dialogue I've given that, and I think of two to three other great lines of dialogue that could be there instead. Two really easy ones. Any place that you can change artwork, allow your players to design that artwork. Uh, we have them design outfits in our game. Well, and I want to go back because there was something I wanted to make a note of. Um, Again, this, this character defining traits, this is, it depends on your goal. Because, like, if you're doing training, nobody cares what you're wearing. You can't even see it, especially if it's XR training. Unless you're training them on how to design outfits or something. Then, yes, it's very relevant. But if you're training them on how to survive a certain type of situation and make sure everyone else survives with you, don't care what you're wearing unless it's, has to do with safety gear. Then yes, then yes. 
that choose their outfit. <laughs> um, so it depends on your goal. Uh, in our case, it depends on your goal. If you're creating a game, it depends on the goal of your game. And the, it seems like the type of games that she makes here at her company, this is definitely um, an option that you would want to try. And it depends on the goal and the genre. But people do really like to design their own characters. So keep that in mind. And that is something that's also very relevant for VR. People love to design their own avatars to be individual and not look like everyone else. And not everyone wants to look like a real person. Not everyone wants to look like themselves. And that includes in games and in VR. I don't want to look like myself in VR. I can look at myself in the mirror if I want to see myself. I would rather look like something else. Um, so there's... A bunch of different kinds. You want to study your target audience and make sure that you understand what they enjoy and want, depending on your genre. There was something I was going to make a uh, note on. So adding the dialogue scripts and then adding branching dialogue to add interest. To, this keeps it from getting boring and frustrating. to help, help people continue to feel like they're having choices. I'll leave that out, though. Depends on your goal. Because you're, it's not so much to keep interest. Sometimes your branching dialogue is to say, do they know, like, for example, if they're calling the fire department, they need to give them certain information, and they need to be coherent in their giving of that information. How do they do that? Um, that's not to keep interest, that's to keep yourselves alive. Or to relay information to somebody to help them stay alive. We have them design avatar creators, we even have them design boyfriends, girlfriends, best friends. We're having them start designing cars they want to be driving in the background. Anything that just allows them to change art, but not affect your story. And three, a little, uh, not predictably, unavoidable consequences. Unavoidable consequences tend to not be fun. Uh, it's where the game seems to be punishing you for maybe not being in control of a situation, but you have a story, so negative things have to happen. Uh, we found that burying this in choices is a great kind of response to it. Uh, for example, in the Demi game, there's a moment where your sister has to get angry at you on television. The point of the game is to balance fame and family and love and health. Uh, so you were so focused on fame for so long that your family fell to the wayside. Obviously, players were upset when they got to this because they're like, yo, my, I never had a chance to actually interact with my sister, so it's not really fair that she got mad at me. You guys didn't make that an option. So we went through and we seeded a bunch of scenes that already existed with small questions and choices that allowed you to choose your family over that moment, and then wrote a couple very small interactions that were, were pretty minimal just to give you those choices. If you ever didn't choose family in that moment, your sister could now reference it when she was on the television show. And if you always chose family, now your friends around you could back you up, and we had some interesting character conflict. Suddenly, the player distaste at the scene pretty much went away. But on that note, it isn't important that any choice you add feels like it matters. So here's some really quick ways to test and make sure your choice feels meaningful. First of all, make sure you're keeping track of character scores. Always add a positive anytime you have a negative. And then if you're going to reference that score later, which I suggest you do, just change a single line of dialogue. So usually, I think Inkle's actually really great with this. You'll notice that when they start a new conversation with a character, or if it's been a while since you interacted with them, you'll notice that they'll have a line of dialogue like, he turns to you with a grimace and sneers as he says. And then they'll have a separate one that's like, he looks at you grinning and replies. And all the rest of it is gonna be identical, but you're now gonna read a new tone into it and it's gonna feel like he's responding to the choices you've made. Uh, always react immediately. I apparently didn't turn my calendar notifications off. <laughs> That's super professional. Uh, always react to it immediately. So essentially, uh, Telltale does the so-and-so will remember this. I like to be a little more direct, have a player, a, another NPC, immediately react to the choice with something very unique to the choice, and then move on. Seriously, like one to three lines, totally fine. Make sure, again, you set up those consequences up front. 
A choice is much more interesting if when I'm looking at it, I feel like both of those things are different and both of those things I will gain something and lose something. Uh, examples of this are if you can create any moment where someone has split allegiances, if there are multiple events that you could be attending, or if you have conflicting goals at that moment. I like her point about changing the tone based on the relationships. And I mentioned up here that relationships can be um, one of your branching determinations. Like, this is how you determine your branches. They can be determined by dialogue, battle classes, weapons, play styles, actions, deadlines, relationships, and so forth. Um, like, Pacifist, Murder Hobo, Undertale, Wild Blood Myth has this option of building relationships and choosing whether or not you're somebody's rival, you are their romantic interest or their friend and so forth. And Pillars of Eternity, which I haven't added to this, also has much, many, much, many, many more options for how you interact and build relationships with people. And, um, or in this case, it would be alliances for Pillars of Eternity too. Uh, both actually both versions but these things determine but it doesn't change the overall story it changes the tone of the dialogue which is a good point that we didn't really notice right away but um good to add so let me add a the okay it's doesn't it makes it feel like it matters i'm just gonna add it here and then i'll figure all of that organization out later but really like dialogue choices affecting relationship which affects tone of response even if same response, different feeling. It'd be the exact same words, but the tone is affecting how you perceive it. Make it clear what they gain and lose. Yeah. And finally, make sure all of your options have very equal weight. One is not more or less interesting than another. Examples, do not use yes, no, and maybe. If your choice says yes, no, and maybe, it's a terrible choice. Uh, it usually should have three options. If you only have two, it probably means you had a great line of dialogue there, you thought of a kind of half-assed one, and then you moved on. Force yourself to think of a couple of options. And if I've experienced this when I've been playing games. Um, I've experienced it on stream where um, you only have like one dialogue option or they'll give you two dialogue options, but they're both at basically saying the same thing. That's not a choice. That's like she's saying that feels kind of like a half-ass choice and try to do better in your dialogue. However, she's saying here she personally avoids right versus wrong answers. Depends on your goal. If your goal is a game for entertainment and drama, then yeah, I would say follow that. But if your goal is training with consequences, there's going to be a right and wrong answer um, because the wrong answer is going to get you killed or almost so or someone else so there is a right and wrong answer if you're doing for example safety training with consequence so yeah you have to know when to break what rule and when does it apply based on your goals What rule or best practice? If you can't, it's probably not a good choice. I also personally like to avoid right and wrong. Our players, at least on episode, don't seem to enjoy when they are wrong. Uh, they feel like the game made them wrong. That's up to you. Feel out your players, but I like to just try to make them all fun. Yeah, if it's a game, yeah, I try to avoid doing right versus wrong because that does make you feel like crap. Depending, of course, on your game. But, yeah, agreed. And it does feel more like a choice when you have three or more options, but make sure they're not all seeing the same. 
because that's just annoying. Um, I get annoyed with that when I encounter that in games. It's like, this is not a choice. It's, it's a non-choice. So here's a really common choice we see in our game. Uh, your crush is talking with your revengeful ex-boyfriend. Do you want to eavesdrop? Show of hands, who wants to eavesdrop? Who does not want to eavesdrop? It's so roughly our breakdown, about 85% of people pick yes. We think it's because eavesdropping feels like it could be bad, that's why people think it's a good choice, but really you just want information and you want to move the game forward. So we've changed it up here, we've given the options equal weight, you could text your ex asking for details, butt into the conversation, or cause a scene down the hall. Quick show of hands, who texts their ex? I know they miss me, this isn't a great choice. Who butts into the conversation? And who causes a scene down the hall? Okay, it's a little better though. I won't make you pick on this one. You can also establish clear consequences up front. This is a little on the nose, but your crush is talking to your revengeful ex-boyfriend, but your class is about to start. If you flunk, if you're late to English once more, she'll flunk you, what do you do? Example that I've set up clear consequences, these choices each have a problem. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna run out of time. Uh, three quick bad choices that you wanna avoid. False choices, these are choices where I make a choice and my character immediately negates it. The world can negate it. It can put consequences on you that make your choice unable to be executed on. That happens a lot in games I play. It's like, well, that's not really a choice then, is it? But if I say, I want to keep the journal, and the, or I want to return the journal to someone, and then my player, my character starts reading it and is like, ooh, this is really juicy, I'm going to keep it. Obviously a bad choice. Player must, character must reflect player. Misleading choices, I have a really bad habit of these. Uh, in that Demi moment, when your uh, sister called, one of our options to respond to her with was, I deserve this. Our players thought it meant, I deserve you getting angry at me and I'm sorry. Let me make a note of that. This is negated. Or my story. Misleading choices. But when they selected it, the character said, I deserve my fame and you need to get out of my face. Obviously that led to some player discomfort and unhappiness and we had to go in and make that choice a little more clear. So just have outside people reading your choices and make sure they're very understandable. And finally, vague choices. I haven't gotten too far in Fallout 4, but I've heard that every now and then they have a problem with this. These are choices where you're actually not sure what it means. You read it and it says something like, disagree. And you're like, disagree with the person, the idea, be angry, be not angry. I'm not sure what is gonna happen if I tap this, so I'm not gonna tap it. So again, make sure you're kinda on the nose with your options. Make it very clear to your players what they're getting into. So, my key takeaways, 30 minutes to talk, who knows what you actually took from it? If you take nothing else, here are the five things I hope you keep in mind. Do not add branches to your story until it is a great story. Do not add choices until you have a great script. Uh, every choice should have a very clear meaning, very clear goals, and very clear consequences. Make sure you've written immediate reactions and never negate a player's agency. I don't really have time for questions, but if people line up or show me if they want questions, I can always go to that writer follow-up reader room thing that's down the hall. Um, we are hiring for people that love interactive fiction, so there's our hire link if you want. You can also email me. There's my email address. Thank you for listening to me talk for 30 minutes. This was three I have more ago, minutes. So I don't know if you're still hiring. Oh, I have more minutes. I didn't know. I thought it was a... Oh, that's great. My thing told me it took 30 minutes. It must have been running. Well, I kind of raced through stuff. So if anyone has questions, uh, I can talk. You can, there's mics here and there. As a quick reminder, uh, please fill out the, four, the little the survey they send you. Uh, I really want to know how I do. Uh, two mics. So she did a great job on her talk. She's very entertaining. She's very like energetic, and she interacted with the audience. She gave them choices, which actually, I mean, that's a takeaway that I get that is not um, the intended teaching, I guess, is that how do you do a, a better presentation is that she 
interact with the audience and gave them choices on the direction of where this was going. Um, so that's great. That's a great learning in a, in and of itself. What suggestions do y'all have um, for how this goes? Because I do want to make this more effective and useful for you. I want you to ask questions. I want you to participate. Um, and I do pay attention to what you have to say. So please do share your suggestions for how this can be better because I do actually want it to be better and more useful for you. Grab a mic. I can talk about our process. I can dive Hello. deeper on questions. Hey, how's it going? You skipped over a bunch of data slides. I did skip over a bunch of data slides. Oh, no, I actually ended up working them in. Okay. Uh, so you saw them. Essentially, we see that uh, no choices, bad, tons of choices, good. Tons of choices, not also good. Uh, there's a sweet step in there. And that people tend to not replay your game. Liam will have more data on that. But what actually makes them replay the most is a great story. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, so you s suggest that um, you should make a great story first, then find branches for it. Does this risk having some scenario where the player thinks, oh, there's one correct story and then a bunch of branches that lead to wrong endings and they're somehow less valid than the one true story? And like, how would you get around that? Sure. We actually had a, a problem with that in one of our stories, specifically when we added premium choices, uh, choices where players could pay to get kind of a cool side story. It made them feel like that was the right story. Um, generally, how we've worked around it is we actually make sure we do follow that kind of uh, diamond structure so that if they go online and they look things up, it feels like it's, they're all seeing roughly the same experience. We also do a lot of playtesting in-house, and we actually will ask our players to pick different choices at times, so especially internally, we'll be like, hey, you go play choosing A, B, A, A, B, and then tell us how you feel about the story. Um, it is a lot of gut checks. We generally haven't, though, aside from when we make paid options, we haven't generally encountered that issue. I think it's because we do it before we move into scripting, so it's still a little flexible enough that if we like a branch more, we're still mushy enough with our story to be like, well, that one's so good. How do we make that one better? Um, so we, we do it a little early enough that we can still futz with it. That kind of helps. Any other questions? You had a hand up. You should have. Good to know. I, I totally can. That's a totally valid question. There it is. Question. Hello. Uh, Hello. What's the best way to prevent FOMO? Uh -huh. uh, for your players? Man, that's a good question. We have a lot of community engagement. I found that Instagram has been a really great tool for us to help our players prevent FOMO. Um, we'll also, in our account, we'll like put up little secret endings and be like, did you know how to get to this? Then if they didn't get to it, they want to, but also they get to see it. Um, I haven't noticed it being, a, we do make replaying an option, so we do, with some of our especially branchy stories, like Demi gets a lot of replays, I think also because she has a lot of fans. Um, uh, yeah, that's kind of, I think really your social media community is one of your best options to prevent a little bit of FOMO. But I also don't mind if there's a little bit of FOMO because I mean, you did your job well because they want to they wanna read a good story. Yes? Um, do you have any data regarding how arbitrary morality systems affect interactive narratives? Not great data. We haven't done a lot with morality systems. In the Demi game, we did points. Uh, so that was where we balanced your fame, your, uh, what was it? It was fame, love, and happiness? Friendship, something like that. It's not quite morality. It's a little similar. We found that at least for, the, for our stories, they don't actually improve anything at all, any of our retention, any of our data. Uh, they don't hurt it either. So our current data has been that we don't use them unless it really helps the story. And if it helps the story, it doesn't hurt to put it in. But we haven't seen it drastically improve anything either. Question. Hello. Um, do you feel that part of the problem with replay value is that there are sites like YouTube where people can play through it once and then they'll go, okay, there's like 11 other endings, but I'm just going to go look up the endings and not play through it? I don't know. I actually feel like YouTube is a response to the problem, but now I'm not talking with that. I'm just talking personally. I think it's that I don't want to go invest. Usually a replay I already know isn't going to be so different that it was worth the 20 or 40 or 60 hours of my time. Uh, just because I haven't seen any games that promote being that different. 
So I don't want to go replay a bunch of stuff I've already seen to see five things I didn't see. I'd rather go to YouTube and be like, yo, what happens if I go to Prince Charming's house instead? Uh, and then just watch that scene. So my hunch is it's the investment it takes. I'm actually going to go, I'm totally promoting another speaker, I'm going to try and go to the Life is Strange talk because I think it was a really interesting mechanic they used where you could just rewind in the moment and then watch what would have taken happened on your other branch. And I'm hoping they talk about that, and I'm curious. So that is, um, we played Life is Strange, and that's one of the things that we noted in that was that you can rewind and replay and see what the choice the changes in the choice, which is really cool how they do it because that helps you to understand the whole story without having to deal with the consequences of it. You can rewind um, up to a certain point. There are um, limits that, to that, but it's a very cool um, way of solving that problem. Yeah. Curious to see how that affected their story and i want to find out which talk that was because i'm going to want to watch that at some point so i'm going to try to make a note to try to find that talk i please hey. my note to myself Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, what is your target audience? It seems like uh, you might have a strict scope there. So do you have adults or other kids? Can you say the question again? So your target audience who are actually going reading your stories or playing the Oh, who's our target audience? Yeah. Um, right now, we're predominantly women ages 13 to 25. And we're just kind of slowly expanding that vertical as we look at other stories. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to hop up to a mic? Or can I, I'll, I'll repeat your question. That's actually a very important note. So target audience. What's the name of this? Pocket Gems. Women. Um, what did she say their ages were? So your target audience who are actually going reading your stories or playing the Oh, who's our target audience? Yeah. Um, right now, we're predominantly women ages 13 to 25, and we're just kind of slowly expanding that vertical as we look at other stories. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to hop up to a mic? Or can I? I'll, I'll repeat your question. It's okay. It's all good. Uh, no, I'll hop over here. Yeah, because well, I'm going to... There's a real lack of data. I'm going to go back and copy the data slides screenshot the data slides um, and then it's very important that you know the date who the data is behind this who the people are behind this data because they may not be yours because like yeah it, it your target audience seriously matters you need to understand your target audience uh, in the industry about how players interact with story and I think that your data is incredibly valuable and that's why people are interested in it. So is there, do you have any more data outside the context of this talk that is publicly available? That is a great question and when I get back I will see if I can make some publicly available because we have a ton of data that we look at uh, what influences the choices people make. Again, like seeing that yes, no and maybe actually does generate bad response rates. Um, so I will, I will aim to make more available for sure. Uh, if you can't make the data itself available, I would love to have more information on how you collect it as well. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to hop up to a mic? Okay, great. Yes. Uh, hi. I was sort of curious about the replayability as well. Um, like personally for me, there's a lot of games I don't ever want to replay, but I love talking with other people about mm -hmm. different um, different things that happen because we made different choices. Like I. Me and my boyfriend will play games explicitly setting out to make different choices mm -hmm. and then either watch each other play or just talk about like completely wildly different scenarios. Um, do you see that in your data, like watching forums or something? We do, yeah. About? So asking about like, do people share their information from their replay? 
that's or from their replay, from their experiences, that sort of yeah. stuff, playing with each other. Um, that's actually a big, I'm glad you're asking something I didn't really talk about. It's a big reason why, even though we don't see branching really affecting replayability for us, we still think branching feels right and it feels like a good thing to do. Because what we see is our players, I'm mostly looking at our Instagrams and our forum, which is where most of our, our players hang out. They are so excited to share when they've experienced a different scene. Uh, in the Demi story, we let you pick the gender of who you date. Uh, how you want to identify who you want them to be, and they have a huge like time talking about, oh well, but if this character is a woman, do they act different? Do they see? How does your scene go? Um, so that's shown us that having at least some branching and some feeling that I have customized my story, um, that people seem to enjoy that, and we definitely see that our stories with more branching get more online engagement. Um, so that for sure is true. Our single narrative stories get almost no online engagement whatsoever. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, basically, uh, during your speech, you mentioned that uh, having choices allows the player to personalize their experience, but they have to feel, you know, impactful instead of being instead of being impactful for fear of, you know, not like just, you know, potentially wrecking the story. Then you also mentioned how a story can serve as a great like uh, a great base for, you know, a malleable base for, you know, uh, putting choices as well as, you know, branching paths and so on. So I would like to know how do you, like, maintain the balance between choices and a concrete story? Because, mm -hmm. you know, obviously you want to make sure that the choices, like, are, like, it's quality over quantity. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious. Yeah, so I think that it's a great question. So talking about... Um, uh, how we balance the story with the choices and the branches. The biggest thing we do is we always have that outline that we did at the very start open. And if we feel like what we're writing is about to make us go back to an outline phase, if it is that big a change that we have to go reassess the outline, we'll actually as a whole team say like, pause for a second. Is this choice worth it? Is this branch worth it? Do we love this choice enough that we are willing to go backwards in that little step of story, then branches, then script, then choice? Um, and sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes, like with the Demi example I showed with your sister, we did go back and re-outline some stuff because we felt it was important. But generally, we always say if it's going to force us to go back a step, we, we won't do it. We'll move. We'll find a different choice. All right. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, OK, that's my last one. OK, I'm going to go into the wrap-up room. It's 3022. No, it's like just around the it's corner. just around the corner, apparently. <laughs> so I'll talk to you guys there. Thanks so much. <laughs> Yeah, so that was a good talk. I appreciated it. Um, it brought up another thought. So the type of game that Pocket Gems is is mostly mobile games. So they're mobile games with a lot of dialogue. There, which is, I want to make a note of that. Mobile games with a lot of dialogue. I tend to get bored with those types of games. So all of the data and advice that she's giving is based on that experience. And based on your dialogue. So I recently, finally, it took me a while, I finally played Breath of the Wild, the original Breath of the Wild game. I haven't got to Tears of the Kingdom yet. But um, trying to remember, there weren't very many choices of dialogue there. And the dialogue, I don't think that I can remember made any real difference in the outcome. It was all what you did out in the open world, how you solved your puzzles and your problems was just a completely different type of choices matter. Um, but the overall story didn't change. How you got there and what you were able to do, like at the final battle, was affected on whether or not you went and did these other things to give you the strength and the backup from other sources and the abilities and so forth when you got to the final boss. But getting there... Because, like, you could choose to go straight to the final boss. At the beginning of the game, you'd probably die. You'd most definitely die. But you could choose to do that. Or you could do the various steps to grow your strength 
get the abilities, get the weapons to go fight the boss and have a much better outcome. So there are different types of choices matter. It's not just dialogue. For her game, for her games, the for her company, dialogue is the big thing. But like I said before, um, there can be all different things that determine your branches. Be dialogue, battle class, weapons, playstyle, actions. Actions in this case would be like Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom. Your decisions are based on what you do in that open world. And that affects your ability to complete the story. Deadlines, relationships. Deadlines is a big deal. And um, I think it plays into Pillars of Eternity to some point, but not anywhere near as much as it plays into Persona. The Persona games like Persona 5, Persona 4. If you miss a deadline, you lose. Or bad things happen. Um... Or you lose an alliance that you would have had or something. So the deadlines that matter. So there's all different ways of determining your branches. This was a great talk. This is going to wrap up what are, um, again, how this applies to XR is it depends on what it is that you're trying to do. Like I said before, it depends on the goals of your experience. If you're wanting to give a entertaining story that's just keeping people entertained and engaged, then um, there are all different types of branching choices that you could have. Ring of Pearls, Bottleneck, which is what she's, it feels like she was doing Bottleneck in hers. True Open World is um, kind of like Zelda. feels like Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom are more of this true open world type. You can go straight there or you can go off on all these various branches in whatever order. It doesn't matter the order that you do them as long as you do them in those decisions and you don't even have to do them. Those decisions determine the outcome of how well you do in that final encounter. The story itself doesn't change, but your choices in where you go, what you do affect how much you learn, how much you know, how much story you actually experience. Um, where because you can miss out on a lot if you don't go do all the things but the order that you do the things doesn't truly matter unless there are some things that don't some quests and so forth that don't unlock until you've done this other quest which is common. common map of many endings feels like it would apply more to training uh, depending on the type of training because i could see some open world training but i don't you'd have to do it wouldn't be true open world. It, you would still have to have constraints on that. Um, and it, it would have to be pretty... Yeah, I can see ways of doing that with as called asymmetric. I think it's called asymmetric VR, where you've got um, two people, there are still constraints. One person is on the computer controlling things that happen in game while the other person's in the headset experiencing those things. Um, that's an excellent way of creating training um, that I've seen. And that's kind of open world because you're giving the person the person and the computer options to trigger things, and they're the ones choosing which things trigger and which things don't. Um, so it's kind of kind of open world, but all open world has constraints of some kind. You have to have constraints, or you're you must have constraints. <laughs> Otherwise, it gets out of control very quickly, and you've got major scope creep. Um. So yeah, tools that can be used. There's Twine. Um, there is Artisy Draft. Artisy Draft is one that my team has used in the past. Um, Artisy Draft. And there's a free version. There's different versions. Tools. This is the one that I've, I have experience working with team on. I don't have personal experience. I'm getting ready to start learning it. But um, this one integrates directly with Unity. And you can create your branching narrative in Artisy Draft and then 
import that into Unity. And I don't know exactly how it works, but I know that it does integrate directly with it to help you with all of that, um, the branching decisions in there. And then there's, what was it, Twine? There's multiple options. And then a lot of the game studios, though, they, um, here, let's see if we can find a branching narrative. Technical tools for authoring branching dialogue. I will share this one here. This one might be, um, because I've seen this one, this is an internal in-house tool that somebody made. There's the video on that if you want to check it out. Twine, yeah. Twine. And there's my stream. That's funny. That's Twine. And this looks like a new one quest. A new one that I have. I, that I haven't. New to me. <laughs> I haven't heard of this one. So here's... Quest Studio. Let me grab these and put these in. These are the big ones. Any questions, any aha moments, anything stand out to you while we were going through that talk or while I was commenting on it? RC Friday. Grab that one real quick. As a lot of them are developed in house. There is a playlist. Let me grab the playlist. It's a pretty complicated complex tool. You can do a lot with it. Um, there is a free licensed version. There are limitations to it, of course. So pay attention. And definitely, if you're looking at Artisy, pay attention because there's single user licenses and multi user licenses, and you can't mix and match. You can't get a single user version, then work with a team that has a multi user and expect that all to work in Unity. You have to have one or the other. Uh, at least that's the way it used to be. They may have improved it. But when I was on um, that team using that tool, it it was pretty, um, you had to seriously pay attention. So that is it for branching narrative. I will probably come back and make a summary video of this at some time in the future. But we're going to do something a bit different starting next time. and. I will let I will make a more formal announcement on what that is uh, soon, but I will see y'all next time. Thanks for hanging out. Good weekend.